Welcome to Crossroads Church. If you're a guest here today, we especially want to let you know that you are welcome here today and that we have a special gift for you. We have a loaf of Great Harvest Bread. We also have a CD of today's service that will be waiting for you after the service. So we want to make sure you receive that. Simply go straight out the door to our um, attendance, um, new members area there, and you'll have someone be glad to hand that to you. We'd also like to remind you, if you pull out your program right now, we have a little coupon on the bottom. It's called our Stewardship of Attendance. And we'd appreciate it if you would fill that out. There's also a place for you if you have any special needs that you'd like to fill out about more information about a small group or wanting to attend a certain discussion at my wife and my home or any other thing you'd like some information about or to fill out a prayer request. We'd encourage you to do so at this time. Please take a few moments and stand and uh, greet your neighbor.
captured by your love, by your amazing spirit. Father, we are here for one purpose, to bring glory to your name. We're here to worship. We're here to learn about you, Lord. God, we pray that you speak to our hearts and our minds today, that we can enjoy your presence. Father, you are amazing. You are so wonderful. You are truly a God of wonder.
Lord, we come before you today confessing our sins. Lord, we confess that we have failed to love you with our whole heart. That we've failed to love you with our whole mind and with our whole, whole strength. Lord, we failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, if we're really honest with ourselves, we've even failed to love ourselves. Lord, there are so many things that cause distractions in our lives. There are so many things that we allow to take your place in our life. Lord, we come before you. We sit at the foot of your cross and we lay these things before you. We come today, Lord, asking for your grace, asking for your forgiveness, and asking for your mercy in our lives. Lord, we come before you today, and at the same time as we lay our confessions before you, we place our trust in you, knowing, Lord, that you loved us so much that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would pay the penalty for our sins and grant us that grace and forgiveness that we so desperately need. Lord, we thank you so much for the many gifts that you pour out upon us, the many blessings that you shine upon our lives. Lord, help us to continue to place our trust in you. Help us to delight in you as you delight in us. Lord, we pray that you would place your desires on our hearts, that our desires might be your desires, and that we might live in one with you. Lord, we pray that as we gather today, that you would speak to us, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, that you would use the message that you have laid on Pastor's Paul, Pastor Paul's heart to speak a word to us, whatever the situation may be, whatever circumstances are going on around us. Lord, we pray for anointing of your Holy Spirit upon him. We pray for anointing of your Holy Spirit upon this day. And that everything we do, everything we may say, may be done and said for your honor and for your glory. We thank you so much for these things, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this reading, or this morning, comes from the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles with you today, and you want to open up just a little bit beyond um, the Gospels, and a little bit beyond Acts and Romans, 1 Corinthians, we're in the go eat popcorn section as I taught my, uh, my summer camp kids. So we're in the book of Ephesians, after uh, Galatians, and we're going to be reading from the fourth chapter, verses, let me look, 25 through 32. So Ephesians 4, verses 25 through 32. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a stronghold. For he who, who, has, be, for he who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, and if you've been here before, um, share something you've learned the last couple of weeks in our relationship series. And if you see somebody new around you, you can maybe share something with them. Look around, if there's someone new next to you, take a few moments and share with them something that's been fun for you the last couple of weeks.
Check, check, check. All right, hopefully you've each had an opportunity to share something. I see a lot of laughing going on, so that's maybe good. And that then um, during our fellowship time after the service, you can have that opportunity to share just a little bit more. I have a brief announcement in that um, my mother, who's not able to be here today, uh, wanted me to share that we, she made some more peach jam for those peach jam friends in our church. And so um, Chris will be back there after the service selling the, the peach jam and so forth and kind of helping people figure out if they... if they would like some of their own. Now Chris is sometimes absent-minded and drops things, but he actually did that on purpose for me today. We're talking about destructive relationships. And although it is true we're selling peach preserves for $3 a jar after the service, um, the reason I had Chris drop that this morning is to have a visual reminder for you today. That sometimes one thing, something gets spilled. It gets taken out of its context of what it was meant for and its purpose. It's hard to get it back in the jar. Your relationship is so special, so special. More special than even my mom's peach preserves. But once it spills, once it's no longer sanitized and clean and pure. I'd be glad to sell this for $3 after the service, but I guarantee that most of you here would prefer to have a fresh new jar. And the reason I want you to think about this day, and I'll have it up on the, the table for you, is to think about how difficult it is sometimes to rebuild a relationship once it's been defective. How even if you put it back in Hey, Chris, could you do me a favor? Just bring that rag up here. This will probably be right the spot where I just whip, wipe out later today, so that would be great. How difficult it is to really make that relationship right, but it's extremely important to try. And to realize with God's help, we can. I want to take a few moments just to, as Chris is cleaning up there, look back a few weeks of what we've learned thus far in our four-week sermon series thus far. First of all, our first week we looked at this diagram of how God is the center of every relationship. God is the author of love. If we don't go to the source to find out how to get good information, how are we going to understand about relationships? Amen? Now talk about, the, if you go to Barnes & Noble each and every week, you'll probably find a new book on relationships. You'll find if you come a year from now, all the old books that were supposed to be the experts are all gone and all new ones have replaced them. But there's one book that's been there and will always be there. And you can always find it there. And it keeps giving you the same advice over and over about love, is that if you're centered in God and you have a relationship with one another, God will draw you closer together. Amen? And if you look at our diagram here, it says just that. As woman and man were made for each other to complement each other. We talked about that. And as we draw closer to God, if you notice the gap between man and woman disappears closer and closer, the closer we draw to God's intimacy, he helps us in our intimacy. Second thing we talked about was a couple metaphors. We said men are like waffles. And we talked about men are like waffles because sometimes we compartmentalize things and we like things in boxes like TV sets, computers, remote controls, football fields, um, the bedroom, all sorts of fun things we talked about. Men like to waffle, get in a certain box and stay there for a while. We're great at staying focused, but sometimes we can't juggle things as well. Sometimes we deny our feelings occasionally. We talked about how women are noodles or spaghetti. They kind of noodle around things. And how many times women can be multitasking. That's a real gift they bring to a marriage or to a relationship is that multitasking, being able to do many things at once, but also how they think and feel better and it can interconnect those two things better than men can. We also gave you a metaphor called the love bank. Do you remember that? It's a phrase we use, ka-ching. Say it with me, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Ka-ching. We talked about how you need to build up each other's love banks by looking at those things that affirm your spouse. What is their love language? What, what things do they like and appreciate? And how do you build that up? By do, affirming them, or physical touch is their thing, or by spending time listening to them or communicating to them, and how that is so vitally important so that you can continue to build that ka-ching so when a time for withdrawal comes, you can do that. We also gave a metaphor last week on communication about the difference between clams and crowbars. Men are sometimes clams. They tend to use three to 5,000 words a day. Women t 
tend to use 10 to 15,000 words a day. So women are sometimes crowbars. They, they want to be able to pry something out of us men in terms of urgency. But the truth is, all of these metaphors are just suggestions. I had someone come to me and say, you know what, I'm kind of a waffle with clam sauce. And I'm kind of more of a spaghetti and a crowbar. Or more, I'm kind of more of a waffle crowbar and, you know, um, a spaghetti with clam sauce. And I said, those are just analogies. Everybody's unique. Everybody's different. Men and women are unique and different, and we can't put them in boxes. Although being a guy, I would like to. That would be my thing. But it's not always neat like that. And so that's why communication is so key, like we talked about last week, because you have to talk about what are your specific needs. I can share with you the survey results that, as a church, we've discussed, but each and every person is unique and different. Last week, someone shared with me a story in the lobby today. What was their favorite part of last week's message? And they said it was the part where my wife talked about her potential affair at Sam's Club and how somebody came and hit on her and wanted to buy her flowers and take her home with her. And I appreciate the fact that she did say no. That was a good thing for our marriage. However, the, the, the nugget that one of the persons also received last week from that was that if we want to affair-proof our marriage, we have to continually to be in conversation, continue to communicate with one another. Because if we do not, we move into the phase we're talking about today, the brokenness that happens. If you turn to your sermon outline sheet this morning, I want to run through a few things just as some background. These are called the five phases of relationship disintegration. My wife and I went to a family life conference last April down in San Diego, and we discussed with some of the most noted scholars and research for the sermon series about relationships. We spent a whole weekend listening, talking, hearing from experts around the nation share information so that when we do counseling, we can do it more effectively with you and for you. Most of you are probably familiar with these phases, but I'll run through them briefly with you. The first one is the romantic phase. And in that romantic phase, as you, you start in with that romance, you know what it's like. First of all, we had to remind people, guys, just for a second, think really hard if you've been married for a while. Just think. What were the things you did when you first started dating? Shout them out. Open the door. What? Flowers. Clean the car. Woo. You're honeymooning. That's not fair. That's not fair. You're still young. I forget that. Let's hear from guys that have been married 10 years or more. <laughs> the guys are quiet, see? <laughs> right here is why we're not in the romantic phase anymore, guys. Right now. Our wives are going, see something. What did you say? Special cards. Thanks for trying. All right. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Rob's a friend of mine. We're, we're friends. The problem is that we start with the romantic phase and we can't think. If we ask that question, when you first started dating guys, remember that? You'd be like, oh, we spent all night together talking and I took them to the zoo and we went and had a walk around the park and then I went out for dinner and, and you couldn't get enough of each other. Remember that time when your, your phone bills were large and you just spent hours on the phone and you just couldn't talk enough and spend as much time as you wanted? And that romance was so real and it wasn't fake. It did something you had to do. It was something you wanted to do. But sometimes we move in after that into what's more of a transition phase. And that transition phase begins to help you move and think about, instead of just focusing on the positive, what you do in the romance phase, all of a sudden you begin to notice those little inconsistencies, those little things that maybe irritate you a little. Like one of the things that I noticed <clears throat> early on in our marriage was the fact that I had a different understanding of the use for pillows. Now, after 18 years of marriage, we still have the same misunderstanding regarding pillows. Growing up, I had one nice pillow. It was from my grandma's feather bed, and when my grandma took her feather bed, she divided it among all the grandchildren. There was eight of us, and she made each of them into eight pillows, and that was the only pillow I needed. I took that pillow with me to camp. I had that pillow with me when I went on mission trips. I had that pillow with me in my bed. I took it with me if I sat on the couch. I got one pillow. That's all a guy needs. Now, my wife grew up in a different understanding of pillows. For her understanding of pillows is the more pillows, the happier you are. When at our first apartment, we had, you know, two or three pillows on the bed, and I kind of looked when I first got married and I walked, and I said, where did the pillows come from? Oh, I just went down to Target, got a couple extra ones. Oh, okay. Then we moved to Rosemount in our next um, house and had two kids by then, and I noticed there were pillows on the couches. And then they started to mushroom in the kids' room, and I noticed that on my bed there was a couple more. I said, where'd the pillows come from? Oh, you know, there was a sale at Target again, and we just picked up a few more. And then we moved to Lakeville to start this new church, and 
pillows started mushrooming all over again. Well, guests are coming over. They may want to sit on the floor in a pillow for a small group. And, you know, we need some pillows over on these couches now. We've got this leftover couch. Maybe with some more pillows, we'll dress it up a little bit. And the bed mushroomed even more pillows from four to six. And I started getting nervous looking at the bed when I walk in at night. Where's the room for me? How do I get in this thing? What do you do with all those extra pillows? And then we move to our house here next to the church. We've got 12 pillows on our bed. There's the round pillows with the little tube-shaped ones, and then we've got the, the silky square pillows with the fringy things, which we never use. Well, they're just there for looks. It drives me crazy. And we have the pillows you would actually use, but we can't use them because they're too nice, and I'll get the, the, the covers dirty, and they match the curtains, so I can't ever really lay on them. They're just there to look at. And there's a fancy name. Does somebody know what those fancy names for those pillows are? Shams. That's it. I, I can't, I, it's not even a pillow anymore. I don't even know what to call it. I have a sham on my bed. It sounds like something I should be ashamed of, doesn't it? It's like this thing. I can't talk about it. I can't sit on it. I can't use it for anything other than it looks nice. And then I take it off every night and I put it delicately on the floor. Sham on you. Okay. <laughs> now, I could be irritated by this. I choose to, as I move into the transition phase and reality phases of my marriage, take this opportunity to use the gifts of the Spirit that God has given me to pray and contemplate, is this this big a deal? Do I need to get this worked up over a wonderful gift my, brought, my wife has brought into our marriage, which is the gift of pillows? And fortunately today, she's not here to give a rebuttal. I noticed how I had this sermon, I said, no, Deb, you don't need to preach today. I'll, I'll take care of it today. And she has an equal large list, believe me, of the little inconsistencies in my life that do to irritate her. But that's the thing, is that we move from that romantic phase and that transition phase into that reality phase, and we start to pick on those little things that we didn't really notice right away. And they can start to crawl in and begin to irritate us. And if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write something down that's not on the screen and it's not in your notebooks this morning or in your, in your message sheets. And that's right in between here, between this reality phase in this retaliation phase, you have an option for a different phase. And I'll get to that a little bit later in the service. It's called the rekindle phase. Rekindle phase. That means that as you're moving towards reality and picking out and seeing the negative things in the relationship and beginning to see the inconsistencies, instead of moving to retaliation and rejection, you go back around and start to do the romantic things, the affirmation things, the loving things. And you can continue to cycle and rekindle or you can move on to that next phase. What happens in that retaliation phase is, you know, you begin to take those inconsistencies and begin to want to change them. It's almost like you have that remote control and you'd like to switch the channel. ka -ching. I don't like that fact that he leaves all his stubbly um, shaving hair on the sink. That's nasty. I could change that about Pastor Paul. ka -ching. You get that little thing where you have that little remote control and you, they just do those things that irritates you so much and you just want to be able to push that button and make them different. But no matter how much you push, <laughs> you somehow see that the channel isn't changing. It's like the batteries are out of the remote and they keep irritating you and irritating you and finally you say, you know what? I'm going to get even. And that retaliation mode starts to, to sink in. And I heard somebody today that was frustrated with their spouse because they're out duck hunting or goose hunting or something today. And so they're going to go out shopping after church and get even. There's way too much laugh on that one. I don't know who he is. There's a crowd of you now. But I ran into some people this weekend when we were in Kansas City. And there were four farmer wives. And they were in the hot tub when Deb and I went down. And we began talking to them. And they had a big bottle of wine. And they were partying and having a great time because their husbands were in the combines. And they couldn't stand it that their husbands were combining in, in Nebraska all weekend and they wouldn't get a chance to talk to them. So they were going to go shopping and spending money and getting even for their, with their husbands. And as I talked to them, they were all Christian people, belonged to an ECL, ELC at Lutheran Church there. They were leaders in their church. And after they offered me a glass of wine, I said, no, I'd just as soon not drink. I'm Pastor Paul. Nice to meet you. They got all, whoa, hide these things. We got into some real conversations about the frustrations that they were having back home. And I just thought to myself, what would it have been like if instead of being here in Kansas City, frustrated at their husband, if they would have went out and hopped in the cab with him and had quality time for six hours to do some clam and crowbar time. 
Or at midnight when he was frustrated and tired and about ready to fall asleep at the combine, would have brought out a, a pot of coffee and some, some snacks and said, hey, honey, I know you've got to stay up all night to get the crops in, and I appreciate it that you help provide for our family. just don't want you to fall asleep. Would you, would you take a snack on something and take a break? Because I'm worried about you. How when, when they came back and said, hey, I'd love to be up for you in the morning, make you breakfast, because I know you'll be hungry when you come in after combining all night. But instead, they were thinking retaliation. And how quickly we move into that, I want for me, our selfishness creeps in. And I know that because I am so selfish. And my sinful nature always wants me to think about what's even. And finally, some of us even move into what I call that rejection phase, where you can't even think about getting even anymore. All you can think about is leaving. All you can think about is not wanting to talk to that person, not wanting to be in relationship with that person. And you start the separate bank accounts so they don't find out about it so that when you leave you get a little money tucked away or you start connecting with that person at work so that if this relationship doesn't work out with me I've got a backup plan and all of a sudden Satan creeps in just like it said in the scripture that we give Satan a foothold and he sneaks in and he plants seeds and he lies to you and rejection seems to be like the only thing you can do from that point on and rekindling seems too far away there's too big a mess and you feel like somehow I can't put it back in the peach jam jar anymore. It's all over the floor. It's all sticky. There's nothing I can do to make it right. But the truth is, folks, it's never too late. Amen? That's the blessing is that if you can recognize these issues and work on them and deal with them in a loving, biblical way, God will work with you. And there's no marriage beyond repair. Let's get into some truths this morning, God's Word, and just whip through these and talk about these things in a real way. If you have your Bible, turn it out this morning. I want you to turn to um, Proverbs 6 and put your finger there. We're going to get to that in just a second. We're going to go through what I call the five habits of highly defective relationships. These were given to us by a pastor by the name of Adam Hamilton. We've heard his preaching the last three days as a staff and as some of the leaders in our church. And we were very blessed to go down there and go through some leadership training. And he did a similar sermon series that he identified these negative habits. And so I want to share some of these negative habits with you today that he identified by doing some research. And then, interestingly enough, these same habits came through in our own survey. Our church is very similar to the Church of the Resurrection in many ways. And these same habits are habits that our church has some of these same difficulties with the surveys that you pull together. For the first one that seems like it is dishonesty. The first one is dishonesty. It's those little white lies. Started even this the very simple ways of, you know, someone might say, Honey, how do I look in that dress? Guys, what do you say? You look great if you want to stay married. But that, is that always true? Sometimes we're afraid to say, Honey, that's not the most flattering dress for you. Or we're afraid to say, And we say these little things to say, Well, I'm just affirming them. But sometimes it's worse than that. Sometimes we are really deceptive. And we hide things from each other. I'll give an example early on in my marriage because then I can't get in as much trouble that way. Um, the, the truth is that I am dishonest. I am selfish and I have all the same negative characteristics of allowing Satan into my life and I wish I didn't have to confess things, things to you but they're true. And one I remember early on in the life of our marriage was when Becca was just born and we had this great plan up front about how we were going to care for Becca. I was in seminary full time, Deb was working full time and we wanted an equal mutual partnership. So we made this plan that she was going to sleep every other night all the way through the night because she had to work an 8 to 10 hour day. And I was going to take my turn to change the diaper. And she even um, um, pumped the breast milk for me so if I needed to warm it up, I could warm it up and feed Becca. And that she could get a decent night's sleep. And we had it all worked out. And it worked great for a day or two. <laughs> and then about the third or fourth day came up and all of a sudden there's that little, <laughs> little squeaking in the bassinet next to the bed. And I pull the pillow over my head just a little bit. And I start to snore a little louder. <laughs> Maybe she'll go back to sleep. Becca, come on, go back to sleep, go back to sleep. And then he goes, eh, 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 eh. and I pull the pillow over more and I snore a little louder. And I wait to see if my wife stirs a little in the bed next to me. Honey, is it your turn to get the baby? Maybe if I snore a little louder, she'll realize I'm in a really deep sleep and I don't hear the screaming three feet from my bed. And I'm being totally dishonest. And I'm just waiting for her. Eh. 
<laughs> Honey, don't you hear the baby crying? <laughs> Honey, are you going to get out of the bed? <laughs> well, fine, I'll do it myself. And I go, yes. In the morning, we get up in the breakfast. We're having breakfast. Honey, didn't you hear the, the baby crying last night? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I was so tired. I studied so long yesterday. I was in the library till late at night. I guess I just it was too tired to get out of bed. Yeah, right. I was lazy. I was dishonest. And I did not respect my wife. But do you think I would say that in the morning? No. What I said was, well, you're awful crabby and cranky this morning, aren't we? How come the coffee's not ready yet? What's wrong with you? And you get the look, guys. You know the look. <laughs> hey, I was up all night with the kid. You slept all night. And all of a sudden, the retaliation starts. And the, the jabs and the pushes and the buttons, you start going at each other. And what I should have said at that point is, you are right, honey. I am wrong. I messed up. I'll take next night's turn. But instead, I just walked out the door, went on to class, pretended like nothing happened. And I was a jerk. And it took me a while to figure that out. And with a little prodding of my wife, she's kind of honed me into a better shape um, over the years. But the truth is that we are all dishonest. And we all lie. And it's got to stop. It's one of the most terrible things in any relationship because a relationship is built on honesty. Turn to that scripture in Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to go through those six things that the Lord detests. God mentions twice in those six things the problem with dishonesty. He says, these are the six things. He says, detestable. That means disgusting. The other way to think about it is, is they're unholy. In other words, these things will never happen in heaven because they're so disgusting and so distasteful, God puts these kind of behaviors in hell that he will never have to experience them. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes for evil. Feet that are quick to rush to evil and a false witness. A second time he mentions that lying. A false witness who pours out lies. And again, similar to this is a man who stirs up dissension among his brothers or sisters. God hates it when we lie, especially to those we love. And if that's one of your issues today, I would pray that you would confess it to God first, perhaps before coming to communion later that you spend some time at this altar and pray before you come and receive the Lord's grace in his meal. And if there's a person that you've hurt recently, to have the courage after church to maybe go to them one-on-one -on -one and, and to say, you know what, I've been dishonest with you and I'm sorry. Second habit we've got to deal with in terms of destructiveness is finances. We have to put our money in the proper place. My mom put this in a good perspective for me. She said, Paul, would you be embarrassed to show your finances, your checkbook, and your budget to your small group, people who know you and love you, would you be willing to share it with them and get godly advice and wisdom? And that challenged me. You know, would I be willing to tell everybody my finances? It's such a personal thing. We always say finances are personal. That we're to share everything else. It says in God's word that we are supposed to hold one another accountable for our finances. And I had to really challenge myself to think about would I be comfortable with people knowing what I give and how I share and how that works. This is one that came through the survey so many times in our church about finances being a barrier or destructive habit. We have people in our church who have separate financial accounts that they don't talk about with their spouses. We have some who never do budgets because it creates friction in their marriage rather than being a healthy thing. And in fact, Phil's going to be talking about that in two weeks because it's such a big deal. We decided to do a special Sunday just on relationships and finances. And the truth is that God's Word talks a lot about finances. There's over 460 references to it. I'll lift up just a couple. Luke 12, 13 through 34. It's a one about talking about this whole understanding of finances. It talks about warning against all kinds of greed. If you have your scriptures here this morning, turn to that chapter in Luke chapter 12. And I'm briefly just going to run through that with you. It talks about in Luke 12 when they're having this discussion. the parable of the rich fool. And this man said, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter against all of you? He said, watch out, be on guard, in verse 14, against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
many times people say, I'm off track financially. What can I do? The first thing I tell people to do is to pray. Second thing I tell people to do is to budget. The third thing I tell you to do is start giving. Somehow God releases abundance when we begin to stop controlling our finances. I had someone recently come to me and said, you know what, I've never really given to any of these special offerings I see in church, but I really feel compelled to give to the Katrina Fund. And they gave me a check, and I said, thank you so much. And I said, I just want to pray with you. And I prayed with them, and they said, what's the big deal? And I said, the big deal is God is going to change your life. Because you've understood a principle in his word that when you give to others, when you give out of, of love and compassion, out of your heart, not out of obligation or guilt, you'll be amazed how God will bless that. He came back later this week and said, you know what? I don't even like it when to talk about these things. He says, but that prayer you told for me on Sunday, this week I got some extra resources that came in and it's almost the identical amount to the money I gave away last Sunday. Now raise your hand in our church if you've had a similar experience about giving. Look around. It's not a rare circumstance. When people give, they often receive. And it's amazing how God loves to bless people that way. And many times finances can be a hurtful thing in a relationship or they can be a helpful thing. Number three that I want to share with you about destructive behaviors. Compulsive behaviors. I won't go into a lot of this. This is such an obvious one. Alcohol, drugs, gambling. It can be anything. It can even be things like pornography. It could be things that somehow pull you away from the love of your, of your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And you have to get these things on track. We're going to have a testimony in a few minutes that will talk about that. Number four, infidelity. And as I share infidelity, I want to remind you that affairs take many different forms. Basically, infidelity is giving your heart to something or someone else. And there are a number of ways that we do that. Sometimes we have what I call an activities affair. We can spend so much time doing things. It can be good things, Boy Scouts, football, sports activities, what, whatever it is. But we're, it can even be church. That we can do so many things. We get caught up in so much stuff. We don't have time for our spouse. It can be in a materialism affair. It can be where we start to worship getting enough money and so we spend so much time at work that we don't have enough time for our relationships. It can be something where it's a career affair, especially where men are guilty of this. And I looked at the surveys. More women said this about men is that my husband spends or my boyfriend spends too much time at work and not enough time with me until it can be to the exclusion of the one you love. You can do a family affair. Men said this more about women where kids will begin to spend more time with their children and spend more time um, talking to their children and spending time with their children and dragging their children to different locations and different activities that their husband gets jealous of their own children. Adam Hamilton, in, in his message he shared, he talked about where there was a time in his life when he loved his daughters more than he loved his wife because he was so frustrated at his wife for spending more time with his kids. An emotional affair. Now this is one of the most deadly. People say, well, I'm not fooling around. If you fool around with your heart, you're fooling around. I don't care what you call it. If you are spending time with somebody on an ongoing basis, and sharing your heartfelt needs with that person. I've heard things like, well, they're just my prayer partner. Well, that's unhealthy. I'm sorry. If it's they're a man and you're a woman, and you're spending time away from your spouses, and even if it's in prayer, it will develop an emotional affair. And from that, we'll move into the last one, which I call physical affair. Each of these are equally destructive. We are most we always focus on the physical one, but they're all destructive. I want to show you a little video clip of someone who's willing to come forward who said they've had some struggles in their relationship. This is the Richards. Some of you know them. They are often doing leadership things in the church. And so watch this and listen with spiritual eyes and a spiritual heart. Involved in a business that was against Diane's better judgment. It was something I very much wanted to do. And because of that, it started leading to a further escalation of communication problems. Keith and I had very good communication skills. And if anybody would have asked, I would have told them that we had the best marriage in the world. As we got further involved in the business, I started listening more to my senior partners and less to Diane. Uh, essentially, it seemed that everything that she wanted to say was trying to uh, break down the business that I was doing. He obviously started devoting more and more time to the business, and we spent less time together. And I felt we were becoming, I was becoming more isolated. Diane asked, to go, or asked us both to go to counseling. I wanted nothing to do with counseling at that time because we didn't need it. And I also learned that because when our arguments would get more and more escalated, Keith 
he slipped into a pattern of verbal abuse. Because of this abusive behavior, I had to learn to take every word that Keith was saying and hold it up against the Word of God so that I could discern what was true and flush what wasn't. I also learned to journal my thoughts and my feelings so that if I didn't feel heard by Keith, I could at least express what was going on inside of me. God made it very clear to me that Keith's behavior wasn't going to stop unless we separated. One of my mentors called my wife and said that he had a word of God for her, but he wanted to confirm it before he confronted me with what he had heard. During this time, there was no way this uh, mentor could have known what was going on in my marriage, and yet he explained to me everything I had been living through. I expressed to Keith that I was planning on separating for a period of time, but I desperately wanted to reconcile and to heal our marriage. And I also gave him very specific things as to what I felt reconciliation was going to look like. Diane left to go to Columbus uh, to be with her parents for a while. I called my senior partner and let him know what was going on, and the very person that had told me that he would be with me forever and to the end of the earth basically told me he couldn't help me. And it was at that very moment that I realized just how badly I had damaged the relationship and how far down a path I had been taken that um, was the wrong path. We would get together every other weekend. We started going to counseling. I started working on some things. But it was about at a month and a half that it really hit me just exactly uh, what I needed to do to change the relationship and make it better and what I needed to do. So. After another month and a half, she came back down. Uh, it did not mean that the relationship was perfect. We had to go through a lot more counseling, uh, but we relied very, very heavily. The most important thing that we did was we relied heavily on prayer and focus on what God's values were and what his principles were for a marriage. We learned fair fighting. We learned how not to interrupt. We learned the love method, which is listen, understand, and verify. And all of those things helped us build a relationship. Um, it's still not perfect, but we have come a long way, and it's, uh, it's, we're pretty much back where we used to be and where we were long before we got involved in the business. Thank you, Keith and Diane. It takes a lot to share that. And hopefully you got a snippet there of maybe something that challenges you in your relationship. And wrapping this up, I want to give you number f the fifth thing that's destructive in a relationship, and that's disrespect. We talked about this particularly when we talked about what men need, and they talked about respect being one of the number one things they are looking for from their spouse. Romans 12.10 talks about this effectively. To be devoted to one another in brotherly or sisterly love. Honor one another above yourselves. That whole sense of honor and respect being a key thought. In our scriptures we looked at earlier, it talks about in Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit them. That understanding of really trying to do is to, to build one another up and not tear one another down is key to respecting one another. One of the challenges I want to give for you today in that is to do this action item. I want you to take out a pen right now if you don't have one. I want you to write something down for me. Particularly if you're in a relationship of marriage or someone seriously that you're dating, so I want you to write a letter of appreciation and just write, I love you because. Write that on a piece of paper. I love you because. And take some time today. Find a piece of paper, write it in their journal, type it in a, on, your, on your computer and email it. And whatever you need to do, I love you because. And let that person know how much you appreciate them. If you're dating, if you're newly married, if you've been married 50 plus years, I love you because. Show them honor and respect. Well, what's the biblical response to a defective relationship? It's two phrases to learn if you've been in my weddings before. You've often heard these phrases. I want to teach them to you again. Repeat them after me. You are right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. It's very hard sometimes for us to say that, but it's the most important thing we can say when we've had some t tough times. The second part is just as important. I forgive you and I'll never bring it up again. And I'll talk more about that second phrase next week, come back, about why that is such a destructive thing is to continually to break things up again when we talk about divorce. The last thing is the one that Keith mentioned, 
How can you really deal with things? You've got to deal with things on a spiritual level. It's not just enough to go to counseling. Keith mentioned what really helped was that they prayed together. We have prayer cards, if you haven't been in the last couple weeks, they're on our information table as you leave for men and for women. Pray for your boyfriend or girlfriend. Pray for your spouse. Prayer changes things. It changes it in here and it changes it in the heavenlies and changes it in here. Pray for the one you love. Let us now move into a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, I think of the thoughts that are so heavily on my heart for those that may be hurting today. And Lord, I just pray that you watch over them in a special way. That if there's any destructive habits, Lord, that they would confess them at your altar this morning as they enter into a time of communion. I pray, Lord, that there would be this, this sense of your presence in such a real way today that you would break their hearts, that when they left today, they would be able to say, I am so sorry, please forgive me. I pray for people that have been hurting for so long that if someone says to them, please forgive me, that they'll be able to receive that and to say, I love you and I'll forgive you and I'll never bring it up again. And to get rid of the retaliation and the rejection phases and to move back into a rekindling state of mind. I pray for these things in your name. Amen. If you've been asked to be a communion steward today, I would just ask at this time if you would slip away and go into the kitchen for a time of prayer and preparation. Um, that you could follow um, Stephanie or Ty up there. And um, we're doing something a little different today called the Great Thanksgiving. This is Worldwide Communion Sunday. You'll find in your offering a special insert. We're taking an um, offering, and there's over 1.3 billion Christians today that are doing this ritual of faith. This is something we all have in Christian unity together. There's over a billion Catholics alone worldwide. Did you know that? And they'll be celebrating with this exact thing, what they would call the Mass the Eucharist. And we're doing the more formal liturgy today to show honor and respect to other faith traditions that do this each and every Sunday. And it's called the Great Thanksgiving. And so I want to share this with you. This may be a little more formal than you're used to, but I want you to do it today because we are honoring the fact that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ with our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters, our Episcopalian brothers and sisters, our, our charismatic brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters that are non-denominational are all celebrating communion today as Worldwide Communion Sunday. Please join in with me. you find it on the screens or those who had picked up hymnals today. It's on page 12. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give the thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth, May we join in his unending hymn as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son Jesus Christ, that by the baptism of his, of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. And most important, you gave us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And in this way, we are blessed this day to remember that on the night when he was with his disciples, he broke the bread and said, take, eat, this is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on that same night, he took the cup poured it out and said, take, drink. This is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for me in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these are mighty acts of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice and praise in terms of Christ's holy offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we may be for the world the body and blood of Christ. Be with one another in Christ's spirit this day, so that we may feast at his heavenly banquet. In your name we pray. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll be taking communion in a couple different forms today. One is known as intinction. They will take a piece of bread and hand it to you, and you would dip it in the cup. The other is one um, that's a little more traditional with the, the crackers or the wafers and the, and the juice. The lights will come down in a few moments, and then this is your time to be in prayer with God. You can pray where you are. You can come forward and kneel on one of the steps. The idea is that you would simply come down and receive as God leads you. We're not going to dismiss you by aisles. If you're new here today, you are welcome to this table. This is for anyone that believes in Jesus Christ. You do not need to be a member here. As the lights are also lowered, we would ask that you would really be a time of reflection, particularly if you need to confess anything before God this day, before receiving the meal. We'd ask the persons come down these two side aisles and either return by the center or return by the ends, but to leave the, the, particularly the front altar open for prayer. Let us now receive our communion together. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. For you, and it is you, Lord, who came to save the heart and soul of every man. And it is you, Lord, who knows my weakness. Gives me strength with thine own hand and lead me on, Lord, from temptation and purify me from within. It is you, Lord, who knows my Gives me strength with thine own hand. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. And Lord, prepare me be a sanctuary pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary oh
And we'd like to let you still remain in an attitude of prayer. You'll find prayer partners on both sides of the church. And we would encourage you that as we receive our, our financial resources, that this is still an opportunity for worship. And so if you have a prayer concern, you can fill that out and put that in the offering plate and give that as a form of offering this morning. But also we'd encourage you that if you'd like to have special prayers to come forward at this time, you may need to be drawing closer to God. And for you, the prayer this morning would be that you need a faith relationship with Him. Maybe you've never thought about the fact that if, unless you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you do not have a healthy relationship with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. And maybe you need that prayer this morning. Or maybe you need to maybe confess something that you've done and you need an encouraging word. Whatever it is, I would open the altar to you and open this time of giving and receiving. We had an announcement video we'd like to show you, but today we're going to just postpone that because of the lateness of the hour and, and to keep the altar open for those who like to stay and pray. I want to send you forth for those that need to leave and so that you can be blessed by that. The announcement was briefly about um, that we're having an all-church directory sign up, and you can find that out in our lobby, and more information will come via email, and uh, you can log onto our website to sign up as well, and I would encourage you to do so, and you'll see the very intriguing video clip next week. Heavenly Father, we just send you, send us forth with your love. For those of us that are struggling with retaliation, allow us to rekindle. For those of us struggling with rejection, allow us to reconcile. And for those of us who see hurting neighbors, hurting friends, give us the courage to reach out in love and acceptance so they may have a full relationship with you. I pray for these things in your holy name. Amen. There is joy in the Lord. There is
Ah, good morning and welcome to Crossroads Church. It is wonderful and fantastic to see each and every one of you. I know it might be a little cloudy outside, it might be a little drizzly. I know you might be thinking about later this afternoon, oh, the Vikings are playing. You may be thinking about the Twins ending season, but the good news is it is exciting to be here at Crossroads on a Sunday morning when we can come together and praise and worship God. I would like to say a special welcome to our first time visitors and guests and encourage you to join us after the service in the lobby so that we can meet and greet you properly and get to know you a little bit better. And we also have a loaf of great harvest bread we'd like to give you. At Crossroads, we nourish the spirit, the mind, and the body. If you would please take a moment to stand up and meet and greet those worshiping around you. <laughs> 